So the regulator was basically demanding solutions for two different strategic paths, forcing the industry away from that traditional open cage net pen in the fjords. Which was just too vulnerable. Exactly. Yeah. So avenue number one was expansion to the open ocean, moving into these high energy locations with huge waves and strong currents. Places you just couldn't farm before. Right. This needs engineering that's more like an offshore oil platform than a fish farm. We're talking structures that can handle waves over four meters high. And the second avenue. That was reduced emissions inshore. Finding solutions for those sheltered fjords where waste accumulation is a big problem because there's not enough water exchange. A whole new era of communication in the global aquaculture industry is coming. Now you have the brightest minds in aquaculture right in your pocket. And what's best? You can listen to all of them while driving to a farm, traveling, or running errands. It's never been this good, and it's never been this simple. Welcome to the Aquaculture Podcast Show, the first AI-based podcast in aquaculture, where you'll find cutting-edge insights in everything that's working in aquaculture, nutrition, health, and production. Inspired by the 2022 article titled Technological Innovations, Promoting Sustainable Salmon, Salmo Salar, Aquaculture in Norway, by Four Heidi Mo et al. Okay, let's unpack this. For decades, the growth of Atlantic salmon aquaculture has been, you know, a massive success story. But there's always been a catch. That growth was hitting a wall, really threatened by these persistent environmental challenges. Exactly. The industry basically hit a regulatory ceiling. They had this huge global demand to meet, but they couldn't just scale up. Doing that would just worsen the problems we always talk about. Pollution, fish escapes, and of course, the big one, parasitic sea lice. Right. So instead of just putting a cap on production, Norway did something, well, really unique. They used a massive state incentive to force a leap. Not just small improvements, but truly disruptive innovation. And that's what we're digging into based on that analysis by Fur, Mo, and their colleagues on the Norwegian yeah. Development Licenses Program. Our mission here is to really pull out the industry's own consensus on where marine salmon production is heading. Yeah, this isn't about policy theory. Mm -hmm. It's about the hard engineering. What did the biggest players in the industry actually bet $1.7 billion on? Wisenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads. We elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. So this whole program was really built around solving that core challenge. It was. This development license program from 2015, it was. Okay. Uh, pretty much unprecedented in global food production. Yeah. It wasn't just funding R&D. It was designed to stimulate very specific, high-risk, high-capital solutions to these big environmental problems. And that high risk is the key part, isn't it? I mean, if a company spends hundreds of millions on some new structure and it fails, that's a total loss. That kind of risk just suffocates innovation. It does. And that's why the subsidy was so crucial. The licenses were awarded for free, no matter the outcome. And here's the real kicker, the real incentive. If the project worked, they could convert those development licenses into permanent production licenses for about 1.1 million U.S. dollars. Wait a minute, a million dollars for a full production license? Given what those are worth on the open market, that's that's like winning the lottery if your tech pans out. Precisely. It was the only way to de-risk these huge novel engineering concepts and get industrial capital moving. And uh, the industry responded in a huge way. How huge are we talking? The scale was just breathtaking. They had over 100 applications come in. In the end, 23 projects were awarded. And the total investment cost, just for those 23 projects, was estimated at around 1.7 billion U.S. dollars. Wow. That's just for the new infrastructure. That kind of investment tells you the status quo just wasn't an option anymore. Absolutely not. So the regulator was basically demanding solutions for two different strategic paths, forcing the industry away from that traditional open cage net pen in the fjords. Which was just too vulnerable. Exactly. Yeah. So avenue number one was expansion to the open ocean moving into these high energy locations with huge waves and strong currents. Places you just couldn't farm before. Right. This needs engineering that's more like an offshore oil platform than a fish farm. We're talking structures that can handle waves over four meters high. And the second avenue. That was reduced emissions inshore. Finding solutions for those sheltered fjords where waste accumulation is a big problem because there's not enough water exchange. 
Okay, so let's look at the winners. When you compare all those initial ideas to the 23 that got the green light, it's the allocated biomass that tells the real story, right? That's where the money went. That's the ultimate metric. And in that open ocean category, two concepts just dominated. First, semi-submersible platforms, and second, rigid floaters. Both had a really high success rate. So a semi-submersible, that's basically technology borrowed from deep sea drilling rigs, right? It is. Most of the structure sits below the water surface, so it kind of rides out big storms because the waves just pass over it. And these two concepts, the semi-subs and the rigid floaters, they took the lion's share of the new capacity. An overwhelming share. Yeah. 61% of the total allocated biomass went to these huge, robust, open ocean platforms. The industry is clearly betting its future on conquering the open sea. No question. Now, on the other side, in the sheltered category, the challenge wasn't massive waves. It was all about biological control. And the winner there was the closed farm concept. Correct. Using impermeable bags, tanks, you name it. Nine of those concepts were awarded, capturing a big chunk of the biomass, about 27%. And the logic there is all about control. Total environmental control. You can manage oxygen, temperature, and crucially, you can physically separate the fish from the outside world. You pump in clean, deep water that's free of sea lice and other pathogens. It moves the whole process closer to what you'd call biological manufacturing. And that success really stands out when you look at what didn't win. The traditional PE rings, the industry standard. They were the second most common application, but only two were awarded. A tiny 5% of the biomass. That's a massive signal from the regulator. A crystal clear signal. They were not interested in small improvements to old tech. All right. The $1.7 billion was for game changers only. Okay, let's get into the specifics of those game changers. Sea lice prevention. How did the winning designs tackle that? It was all about physical separation, not chemical treatments. So building a better wall, not a better weapon. Exactly. The first strategy was shielding. Physically blocking off the upper layers of water where the lice larvae live. 17 awarded concepts used that. Makes sense. And the second? That was using deep inlet water, which we mentioned, pumping in clean, parasite-free water from the depths. That was a key feature in the successful closed systems. And it's really telling what they rejected. Concepts that relied on chemical or freshwater treatment were mostly turned down. Yeah, the authorities were worried about lice developing tolerance. They were playing the long game on biosecurity. What about escape prevention? That's always a huge issue. A critical factor. 87% of the winners had extra measures. We're talking much stronger materials like next-gen netting fighters or stiffened steel plates. And over half of them included a double barrier system. A failsafe. If the first barrier is breached, there's a second one holding the stock. That's the idea. It's all about redundancy and structural integrity. So what this all adds up to is not one single future for aquaculture, but two, right, a split in the market. That's the key takeaway. You've got these massive, robust, open ocean units on one side, and these highly controlled, closed, biological manufacturing plants on the other. And the common thread is less interaction with the outside environment. Less and less. And that means farmers have to rely much more on technology sensors, automation, remote systems, to know what's going on with their fish. It creates more distance between the farmer and the stock. It does, and it demands a whole new skill set. And of course, a whole new supply chain. A lot of this know-how was pulled directly from Norway's offshore petroleum industry. That expertise has now been mobilized for aquaculture. And while this was all designed for salmon in Norway, the global implications are obvious. Absolutely. These technologies, bigger structures, better environmental control, they're highly applicable to other species and other parts of the world facing the same constraints. So the big picture is a future that's more diverse. You've got these huge open ocean platforms and these sophisticated closed systems both aiming for environmental separation. Right. And that raises a really important question for the future, you know, for regulation. Since sustainability is now so heavily dependent on which high-cost, high-tech path you choose, how do regulatory frameworks adapt? How do you govern an industry where one farm looks like an oil rig and the other looks like a factory? The old rules might not even apply. That's the next big challenge. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow the Aquaculture Podcast Show on your favorite platform. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook to stay updated on the latest episodes and industry insights. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.